Good evening. I am Teresa Rajak Talley, Dalhousie's University's Vice Provost for Equity and Inclusion. It is my greatest pleasure to welcome you to our third episode of Dalhousie's Viola Desmond Legacy Lecture Series. Tonight's event is being hosted at the beginning of what is nationally commemorated as Transgender Awareness Week, November 15 to 19. Dalhousie joins with others in commemorating this week, and we have raised the transgender flag on our campuses for the week. In addition, on Transgender Day of Remembrance, November 20th, we will lower all our flags in honor of those who have fought for Transgender Remembrance Day. For those of you who are now joining us, welcome. There are a few housekeeping notes for everyone. The program for tonight involves a Mi'kmaq welcome. I will then give a brief introduction on Viola Desmond and why the series. We will then have a local spoken word artist to set the context of the keynote. A DAL student will introduce our speaker and after we will have Q&A. Attendees can turn on closed captions for this event from their meeting controls. You should see three tiny dots on the top of your right side screen. Select turn on closed caption from the drop down menu. As an attendee, you can ask questions in the Q&A. The Q&A icon will be visible on your screen. If you want to ask your question anonymously, that option is also available by checking the anonymous box when typing in your question. We apologize, but the chat function has been disabled for security reasons. The event is being recorded and will be made available for a short period of time in the coming weeks via our Viola Desmond Legacy Lecture website. This is a virtual event, so if there are technical glitches, please be patient. I begin by acknowledging that Dalhousie University is situated in Chibokto, Halifax, the ancestral and unceded territory of the Lunik. We are all treaty people. Dalhousie respects the treaty, the people, their way of life and their elders. So we begin our program tonight with a Mi'kmaq welcome from Catherine Martin. Catherine Martin is a member of the Melbrook First Nation in Turo, Nova Scotia, and is currently the Director of Indigenous Community Engagement for Dalhousie. Kathy, please give us your welcome. Kwee, madawa loktiwok. Nin gadalinan maltai, welegiskuk. My name's Catherine Martin, and I'd like to welcome all of you to the unceded territory of my ancestors and me. Um, especially in this area where my great-grandparents across the harbour at Tufts Cove um, spent much of their summers um, uh, along the shores and at the Halifax explosion uh, lost many of their children and, and their home. So I, I honour them as much as, in, not at, well, I honour them tonight as I sing and welcome you to the unceded territory to acknowledge the hard work and resilience of our ancestors. And tonight is especially um, special because we're going to hear yet another strong couple voices this evening, just as Viola Desmond spoke out against um, injustice at a time when you really needed courage. And our speakers tonight are also showing that strength and spirit that Viola uh, Desmond did uh, for not just her community, my community as well, because we too uh, experienced the same discrimination where we weren't allowed to be in certain parts of uh, the theater. Uh, the chant is to welcome all of you, all nations together, and it's a feast chant that Sarah Denny of Eskasoni taught to me.
and sit in Ogama. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Kathy. I'd like to just give a brief intro to who is Viola Desmond and why Viola Desmond Lecture Series. Viola Irene Desmond Lee Davis was born on July 6, 1914 in Halifax, Nova Scotia and passed away on February 7, 1965 in New York. She was a Canadian businesswoman and a civil libertarian who built a career as a beautician and was a mentor to many young black women in Nova Scotia and the region. It is, however, the story of her courageous refusal to accept an act of racial discrimination that plummeted her to national recognition. Viola was born into a large family, including 10 siblings. Her parents were highly regarded within the black community. Motivated by her parents' example of hard work and community involvement, Viola Desmond became a successful independent businesswoman. After a short period of teaching in two racially segregated schools, she began a program of study in beauty culture in Montreal and then in the US. Desmond returned to Halifax and opened V's Studio of Beauty Culture, catering to the Black community and expanding her business across the province, New Brunswick and Quebec. During Viola's during Viola's lifetime, although racism was not officially acknowledged in Canadian society, Black persons in Canada, especially in Nova Scotia, were, were aware that the unwritten code constrained their lives. For example, on the evening of November 8, 1946, Viola made an unplanned stop in the small community of New Glasgow after her car broke down en route to a business meeting in Sydney, Nova Scotia. She arranged for a hotel room and decided to see a movie at the Roseland Theatre. Viola requested a ticket for a seat on the main floor, but was told by the cashier that was not permitted to sell downstairs to tickets to people like you. Viola realized that he was referring to her skin color and decided to resist by taking a seat on the main floor. She was confronted by the manager, a police officer was called in, and she was dragged out of the theater, injuring her hip, knee, and was issued a warrant for arrest. She was held in a cell overnight. According to Viola, though shocked and frightened, she maintained her composure and she sat bolt and upright all night long. Desmond was charged with attempting to defraud the provincial government and without the right to a lawyer. At no point in the proceedings was the issue of race mentioned. Still, it was quite clear that Viola's real offense was that she had violated the implicit rule that black persons were not to sit with whites on the main floor of the theater. Decades later, Desmond's story began to receive public attention when her sister Wanda Robson, at the age of 73 in 2003, enrolled in a course on race and relations in North America at the University College of Cape Breton, now Cape Breton University. Wanda was encouraged to tell her sister's story and published a book titled Sister to Courage 2010. It was not until April 15, 2010 that Viola Desmond was granted free pardon by the first black and female Lieutenant Governor of Nova Scotia, Dr. Mayan Francis. So when Dalhousie celebrated its 200th anniversary in 2018, the university agreed to host the Viola Desmond Legacy Lecture Series with acclaimed speakers. The first in the series took place in October 2018 with the civil rights notable Angela Davis. Our second in the series featured Indigenous rights champion Michelle Odette, who spoke about missing, murdered Indigenous women and girls. It is in the same spirit as Viola Desmond Legacy Lecture Series that Dalhousie University acknowledges that African Nova Scotians for 400 years have contributed that has enriched all of us. We are privileged tonight to hear from a proud African Nova Scotian, published author, spoken word artist, 
community advocate and arts facilitator from Norton and Dartmouth. Kylie Johnson has published two books, Expect the Unexpected in 2016 and Afraid of the Dark 2018. We are also proud to say that Gailey is also a Black Student Advisor at Dalhousie University's Black Student Advising Centre. Gailey, we are anxious to hear your words. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. I am super honoured to be here with you tonight, um, sharing this space. Um, the first poem that I'm going to do is really a dedication um, to my community and to all of the leaders who basically paved uh, the road that I now walk on. And it's called I Am Because We Are. I am because we are. I give thanks to the past created before I could walk, to the books written before I could talk, to the stories of the past that led me to light, for all of the victories that lessened my fight, for the one who knew my beauty before I could see, for the one who knew my purpose before I knew me, for the one that understands what is hard to convey simply because they have traveled this way, to the one who knows that my strength isn't rooted in trial, to the one who gives reassurance to my in denial, to the village where everyone has a role to fulfill, to the builders and artists sketched in skill, to the dreamers who never stopped dreaming so I could be, because I am you and you are me. A community hub of love and kin, etched in my skin affirmations of worth to represent all who created the steps and all those who will follow, because what is done today will change tomorrow. The next one um, that I'm gonna do is in honor of Viola Desmond and in remembrance of her sister Wanda as well. And this one is called A Sister's Courage. A sister's courage to fight, to speak, to teach, to lead, to live, to dream. Understanding the importance of access and inclusivity, challenged by white fragility that tries to strip us of our confidence and determination. They put in societal structures like segregation to bond us through barriers and pain, internalizing a shame and a means to defame us. A sister's courage knows the significance of identity and representation, of action and education, of truth and reconciliation, paving the path for the next generation. Resistant resilience in a fight for civil rights, but in reality, it's the liberation of a nation that was always destined for greatness. It's through our sisters we carry honor, wisdom, and vision, giving thanks to those who have passed and those still living. The intersectionality of being a woman who is Black literally means paving our own path redesigning, reframing, restructuring, rebuilding, the art of teaching our children the truth, starting with who? Her story. Today they tell in glory, but at the time she must have experienced heavy grief, handcuffed by police that tried to justify how she didn't comply with rules unjust, discriminating and divisive, but she kept on fighting. Innovative, creative, and community-centered, she mentored, cultivating safe spaces for Black women to feel seen and heard. A sister's word, to address the oppression Canada covers in the land of the free, a land where it's hard to see people that look like me. A sister's courage is reminding the world of your sister's legacy so they will never forget. A time where we can reflect to the point of a pardon and a public apology, finally showcasing the light because of Wanda, Viola's story was finally told right. A sister's courage through action, advocacy, aspiration, and hope. Because of a sister's courage, we now have a black woman on a banknote. Our sister's footsteps are still guiding us to fight, to speak, to teach, to lead, to live, to dream. Thank you. Thank you for those powerful and inspiring and thoughtful words, um, Gailey. And you reminded us that Viola Desmond is the only black woman to be featured 
on one of our Canadian notes. So thank you for that. And I think those powerful words and the way you presented it, next time I'll just have you do the introduction and forget me with all that facts and data and so on presented in that boring way. So thank you. And now for the moment we have been waiting for to hear our legacy lecture speaker. I invite Charlie, a member of our organizing committee, to do the introductions. Charlie Gould is a fourth year student at Dalhousie studying management and gender studies. They have sat on Dal Out, Dalhousie's 2SLGBTQ plus society for two years as the education coordinator. Charlie is from Nova Scotia's Annapolis Valley and their pronouns are they and them. So Charlie, please do us the honor. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Um, super excited to get to do this. Um, so Vivek Shraya is an artist whose body of water crosses the boundaries of music, literature, visual art, theater, and film. Her album Part-Time Woman was nominated for the Polaris Music Prize, and her best-selling book I'm Afraid of Men was heralded by Vanity Fair as cultural rocket fuel. She is also the founder of the award-winning publishing imprint, BS Books, which supports emerging BIPOC writers. A seven-time Lambda Literary Award finalist, Vivek was a Pride Toronto Grand Marshal and has been a brand ambassador for MAC Cosmetics and Pantene. She is a director on the board of the Tegan and Sarah Foundation and is currently adapting her debut play, How to Fail as a Pop Star for Television with CBC. We're so excited to have you, and now we get to now we get to hear from you. So over to you, Vivek. Thank you so much, Charlie. That was so nice. Um, <clears throat> hi, everyone. Uh, thank you so much for having me. I, gosh, I'm so honored to do this. Um, when I got the invitation to give this year's Viola Desmond Legacy Lecture, I and I looked at the people you had before. I think I was like, I think they asked the wrong person. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, thank you so so much. Um, you know, this is the part where I try to win you over by telling you that my partner is actually from Truro, so I have a strong affection for Nova Scotia and Dal. And I I was really hoping I'd get to come out and do this in person, but uh, maybe sometime in in the future I, I'll I'll be able to come out to to share other work. So again, thank you so much for having me. Um, and thank you, Guy Lee, for, for setting the stage for this conversation as well um, and for sharing your uh, wonderful and important words with us. Um, you know, when I got asked to do this, I was trying to think about what would be, you know, the most, uh, what would be the best way to um, honor Viola Desmond. And uh, I started thinking a lot about what it means to use your voice. Um, to use your body um, as a form of resistance. And for me, um, you know, obviously I, you know, being just an artist, um, I'm by no means have done the work that she has done um, for us in the world. But um, I think as an artist, one of the things I'm always thinking about is how to use uh, my art and my art practice to um, challenge uh, dominant narratives um, and to also challenge misogyny and homophobia and racism um, and sexism in the world. Um, and so what I'd like to do um, is talk a little bit, um, well, the title of my talk today is called How to po Write a Poem About Racism. Um, and um, I think that of all the mediums I've tried to explore as an artist, writing poetry about racism um, was maybe the most challenging, one of the most challenging things I've, I've tried to do. And so I'm sort of going to walk you through my process. I hope some of you are uh, creative people, artists, writers in the room tonight. So hopefully some of this will be inspiring to you. And for those of you that aren't artists, I hope it's still um, interesting to you um, on some level. Um, I, because I'm an artist and I have a low attention span, uh, I will try to hold your interest by weaving uh, my own poetry um, in and out of my talk. So you'll get a little bit of me sort of talking and then you'll get some poems and we'll go back and forth. And then um, I have the wonderful privilege of having a discussion um, with Omi Shire, um and you. So you can think of your most difficult questions now and um, I will do my best to answer them um, at the end. So I can't recall the exact incident Perhaps it was seeing the announcement of another all-white panel or literary event or award finalist in my social media feed, which yes, even in 2022, Diverse Canada still happens. 
I do recall feeling frustrated and defeated, the same emotions I feel every time I witness the prevalence of whiteness and pacing around my apartment while texting my friends about it. I recall closing my text with, you know what, I think I'm gonna name my next book, Even This Page is White. Um, I was half joking at the time, but you know, as I found as an artist that you never know where these ideas are gonna come from. And that phrase, Even This Page is White, stayed with me and eventually found its way into a poem, um, White Dreams. Thank you so much for bringing that slide up. Um, this was the first poem I wrote for what would become my first book of poetry, Even This Page is White. I have white dreams, billboards, magazines, mighty praise and accolades, top 10 lists and top 10 hits. So I climb, dodge boulders, earn blisters, but even the top of the mountain is white. I have a white boy I top. I dream on his long body as his past bodies have long built upon mine. But when I come on the dip in his spine, even the color of my pleasure is white. Body, you betray me. The only brown I make for sewer, but for him, my brown body makes white, makes nice. If my cum was brown, would he still eat it? From my core, I seek courage, but even my bones are white. Is it my skin that betrays this skeleton? I pray for answers, for my dreams, hunched back, dim light, blue ink, blank paper, knelt over, wept over. Now I grasp why 34 years of praying through writing awoke no God. Even this page is white. So I protest this page, mask it with words about being brown, about my mother and motherland. But even these words have white dreams, billboards, magazines, crystal trophies, because what are words without dreams? And what is a dream if it is not white? So I've always found the challenge of exploring a new art medium invigorating, which is one of the reasons why I do it all the time. But the realm of poetry felt unknowable and its entry felt impermissible. I felt as though I needed to tread cautiously, reverently, hands clasped, for fear of offending not only past and current poets, but poetry itself. When I sent early drafts of the poetry manuscript to my poet peers, um, I just had like this panic for a second that maybe my mic was muted and I'd been doing this whole thing and my mic was muted, so I just did a quick check. Anyways, it looks like we're all good. Um, I felt like I needed to tread cautiously, reverently, hands clasped for, fearing, for fear of offending not only past and current poets, but poetry itself. When I sent early drafts of my manuscript to poet peers for feedback, I often asked, does this read as amateur? Somehow I managed to forget my own history of writing journals of poetry in grade school, and that I even had some poems published in a religious magazine in India in my teens. It was only when I began reading works by poets of color um, that this anxiety began to lift. I'm happy to talk about this more at the end, but one of the books that really, really informed my own pro practice that I owe so much to is Audre Lorde's Black Unicorn. Um, and it's in reading other books by BIPOC authors that I felt a, a kinship and a kind of understanding in their styles as varying as they are I felt permission to find my own voice as opposed to feeling intimidated and restricted by abstract rules. Next slide, please. How often must you prove your pigment when your entire body is painted bronze? Have you ever heard white question its color? Snow, moon, salt, milk, tooth, chalk. What if there's no right way to be brown besides the brown you are? Soil, nut, clove, wheat, bark, Pluto. I realized then that poetry itself wasn't the barrier, but rather the whiteness of it. Most poetry I'd been exposed to was by white authors. 
This realization was solidified when I noticed mine was often the only brown body in the room at poetry readings I attended. I don't know if you've ever had this experience going to a poetry reading, but it's like <laughs> there's often, at least the ones I was going to um, in Toronto at the time, it was like mostly white people, uh, which to me just like confirms so much about, I think my general anxieties about, you know, whether or not I had the right to write poetry. Of course, the dominance of whiteness and ex exclusion it breathes can be observed in any art medium. But navigating poetry's white guard felt particularly difficult whilst while writing a book of poetry that delves into racism. Above agonizing over what makes a poem good, or rather who decides what makes a poem good, I felt an added concern of how to write a good or effective poem about racism as I could foresee a criticism of poor craft wielded as a way to dismiss the content. I was also concerned about readers of color in particular. If I considered white readers and their potential reactions, was I prioritizing whiteness? Is there a way to write about oppression by white people and white systems without centering whiteness? And I feel like this is like maybe a very central question for me in my work in general is like, how do you write about oppression in a way that doesn't feel like it's ultimately for the white gaze or the white lens? Um, and, you know, we can talk more about that. Next slide, please. Are you staring at me because? Are you not looking at me because? You don't like me because you don't desire me because you desire me only because I don't like myself because I wish I was like you. Am I safe here? Where are the others like me? There are no others like me. I was not considered because I was only considered because why would you say that? Did you say that because I thought you cared about me? Do I respond? How do I respond in a way that you'll hear me? How do I respond without making you angry or uncomfortable? Can I be okay with not responding? Why doesn't somebody else respond? I shouldn't have said anything. Are you ignoring me because I responded? There has to be another explanation. Maybe I'm making this up. Maybe I'm too sensitive. Maybe I'm too defensive. Maybe I am undesirable. Not everything is because I can't assume the worst. Of course I'm safe here. Of course there are others like me here. You probably haven't seen someone like me. I just need to work harder. I just need to work harder. I just need to work harder. You don't know how to think about this. You don't mean what you said. Of course you care about me. Of course you'll hear me. Maybe it's good for you to be uncomfortable. Maybe I'm better off in the long run. What would I think of if I wasn't thinking about this? A dog named Lavender? A home in Idaho, a book about landscapes. What would I make if I wasn't thinking about this? Who could I be if I wasn't thinking about this? Talking about racism with my friends of color, it often feels like these conversations and rage cir circulate solely amongst us. We provide necessary comfort to each other, but I want to see white people be angry and take action against racism too. I wanted to write poetry that would provoke this. Next slide, please. Thank you for naming all of your privileges. Now what? As a non-Black person of color, I also wanted to highlight the specificity of anti-Black racism as a way to speak to my own complicity. Can I write a poem that does this without appropriating or being offensive? As a settler in Canada, I had to consider what it means to be given a prep platform such as this one to discuss racism while Indigenous people continue to face violence and the dismissal of the violence. No poem I write feels adequate in addressing this. Next slide, please. Podium mic on. Remind them, this land is not ours. Heads nod, hands clap, feet fixed. Are you even in the room? Once my mother accidentally drove near a reserve, the only time I have seen her afraid hit gas pedal. Strange to be Indian and the sound of car locks to be synonymous with Indians. Is acknowledgement enough? I acknowledge I stole this, but I'm keeping it? 
social justice or social performance? What would it mean to digest you and yours and blood and home and land and minerals and trees and dignities and legacies to really honor, no show gratitude, no word for partaking in violence in progress. Last year, Baltimore intersection, black man approaches. Once again, finger reaches for car lock, except this time the finger is mine. So the project of writing poetry about racism often felt futile. In the end, I concluded that perhaps the best strategy is to deploy a league of approaches, stark, direct, repetitive, allegorical, conversational, with the hope that at least one approach in black ink will reach a reader and render the page a little less white. Um, I would like to close with a poem I wrote that was inspired by this quote. Um, next slide, please. Um, so as a brown kid who grew up in Edmonton in the 80s and 90s, the music I was exposed to was either my parents' Bollywood tapes or the Hindu bhajans that were sung in religious organizations I attended. But when Whitney Houston's big song from The Bodyguard happened, I connected with it immediately. Hopefully all of you remember, some of you, I know some of you are very young, but hopefully some of you remember the Bodyguard soundtrack. Um, <laughs> um, the song possessed a kind of devotional and melodic quality that I'd only heard in Indian music before. And the same could be said um, for so much of 90s R&B, which I was such a huge fan of. And so when I, uh, you know, and I have to say that it was the music largely made by black female artists that opened me up to the world of pop music, as not only as a musician, but all, also as an audience member to this day. So when Nicki Minaj said this quote a few years ago, um, black women influence pop culture so much, but are rarely rewarded for it. Um, I found myself like very upset about it and very uh, frustrated and haunted. And so what I did was I went through my iTunes um, which I guess maybe doesn't exist anymore now. Wow, really dating myself here. The Bodyguard iTunes. <laughs> and what I did was I pulled one lyric from every female Black musician in my iTunes to compose a poem as an homage to Black female musicians who I certainly wouldn't be a musician without. Um, and I'd love to um, close my presentation here with you um, with this poem. Um, and like I said, after I will be in conversation with Omi Shire, um and taking your questions, I'd also love to dedicate this poem to Viola Desmond. Um, thank you so much again for um, all of the, the world that you've helped build for us. And again, um, thank you all to the organizers for um, inviting me into this space to, to share a little bit about my work, my work and my practice with you. My love has come along. My lonely days are over. I never knew there was a love like this before. This is no ordinary love. Birds flying high. You know how I feel when the sun shines, we shine together. Brown skin, you know I love your brown skin. I love your smile. Oh, when you walk by every night, talking sweet and looking fine. There's a boy I know. He's the one I dream of. I keep on falling like a moth to a flame burned by the fire. I've got this burning, burning, yearning feeling inside me. It says one thing that's got me tripping. Dust yourself off and try again. I've been doing my own thing. Love has always had a way of having bad timing. You gotta be bad. You gotta be bold. You gotta be wiser. Did you say I've got a lot to learn? 
free your mind and the rest will follow. Don't need no hate oration, holleration. Perfection is a disease of a nation. Some of y'all ain't writing well, too concerned with fashion. Living my life like it's golden. Well, it's a groove thing. It's got a funky swing. Seems I have the strangest dream. If it's murder, you know she wrote it. Okay, first things first, I'll eat your brains. I bust the windows out your car. Can you pay my telephone bills? We think you're a joke, shove your hope where it don't shine. I know what you're doing, yeah, yeah. You need to give it up, had about enough. Girls, you know you better, watch out. My milkshake brings all the boys to the yard. You can catch me at the hot spot. I bet you want the goodies. My sex is like, whoa. I put my thing down, flip it, and reverse it. If that's your boyfriend, he wasn't last night. He got me open like 7-Eleven. Sock it to me, sock it to me, sock it to me, sock it to me, sock it to me. I guess that can't get an E-N. Drop it, drop it low, girl. You can bring it back up and make the fella say, damn, bag lady, you gon' hurt your back. I guess so weak in the knees, I can hardly speak. Please stick to the rivers and the lakes that you used to. Don't walk away, boy. My love won't hurt you. Boys and boys should be together. I try to say goodbye and I choke. Can't you see that I'm lonely? Rescue me. Tell me the truth, boy. Am I losing you for good? What I need from you is understanding. Thank you so much. Oh, and I oh, think that's amazing. <laughs> no, that's amazing. Thank you. Hi. I'm clapping. <laughs> so you saw me dancing. I'm not sure if I'm on the screen yet. Um, I see. You you okay, great. Um, wow. Am I on screen? No, I'm sorry. I have to introduce you. Oh, oh you have to introduce me. You are. I was just ready to start. Okay. <laughs> My I bad. Know people know who Dr. Dryden is, but I still have to introduce you. Okay, and, and thank okay. you back for that amazing presentation. I am sure the audience is thrilled as I am to ask a question. And just as a reminder, please post your question in the Q&A, the Q&A &A function on your screen and it will pop up to us. Um, yeah, let me do my dues and introduce my friend and colleague, Dr. Omushori Dryden. Dr. Dryden is a Black Queer Femme and Associate Professor. She's the current James R. Johnston and Dauche in Black Canadian Studies, Faculty of Medicine, the Interim Director of the newly established Black Studies in STEM Research Institute at Dalhousie University, and the co-lead of the new national organization, the Black Health Education Collaborative. But after all of that, she's a great moderator, so I'm going to hand the talking stick to you, I'm sorry, and turn my microphone off. Thank you for doing this. Thank you so much. That was great. Oh, there I am. Um, I just thought I was supposed to start. You see what happened? <laughs> um, because you were you were doing your poem and I was dancing. Um, and then I started looking up other lyrics of black women right that really resonated with mm -hmm, me mm -hmm. so i was thinking of janelle monet's yoga because she has um uh as part of her uh core she says you know even when i'm sleeping i got one eye open you cannot police me so get off my areola i'm not yes, trying to sing. Yes. i'm not singing out loud or yes. of course because i have um renaissance on repeat of course <clears throat> and so um uh, where Beyonce says, you know, I'm one of one, I'm number one, I'm the only one, right? I think this has just been resonating for people, right? It's been yes, resonating yes. for many in our community and outside yes. of our communities as well. Um, and then I was in, of course, um, the bodyguard. I had the cassette. Uh, uh, yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Which stretched out. And I went through a whole period of 
Queen of the Night. Yes. That was just, yes. right? And so where she's really talking about, you know, I got the stuff that you want. I got exactly. the thing that you need. I got more than enough. More than you know. Right? Right? Uh, I feel like that was a trans <laughs> anthem for me. Sorry to interrupt. It's like no, uh, exactly. when I, I used to hear that song growing up, like it, I feel like it, celebrated my own femininity like that song there was something about that and i'm every woman like both those songs on the bodyguard soundtrack to me i'm like this is a trans soundtrack <laughs> it, when i tell you it was and again this is why i was thinking of janelle monet and thinking about beyonce and thinking about the the poem i there and and art and culture right um because i too went to those poetry slams <laughs> In the nineties, <laughs> <laughs> I still love poetry, but I too went. Um, but there is something liberatory in this, right? And you know, this is a Viola Desmond um, uh, lecture, and it, you know, we are thinking about liberatory practices and transgressive practices, like the ways in which we embrace ourselves fully. So I so appreciated your poem, write these lines, yeah. Um, because when you were talking, I was also thinking of Audre Lorde's um, Sister Outsider, right? Her mm -hmm. book of essays. Um, but her quote, gosh, I'm, again, I must have read this in, in the 90s. I like, wrote it out and stuck it everywhere. Where she says, you know, it is axiomatic that I define myself for myself or else I'll be defined by others to, um, for their use and to my detriment. Mm, I just got chills. When She's... I, right? When I yeah. first read that. It really, um, it really highlighted why it's important for us to know ourselves. Like this is what um, Viola did, as much as she was shaking. Totally. Right. She was like, "No, no, mm -mm, I'm not moving. You're gonna, you're gonna have to, you're gonna have to raise the stakes because I know, I know who I am and what I'm doing." Um, but then also, when you were talking about writing and coming to a point where you're like, "Oh no, I." I get to use my voice. I get to be in this conversation. Um, not everyone will want to converse with me, but that's good. I'm good. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good with that. Um, but how did you get to writing without the anxiety or without the, you didn't say anxiety. I think it was more um, self-doubt maybe. How did you get there? Because there's yeah. people who write yeah yeah i mean it's first the thing I, just, I still wrestle with right yeah yeah i mean you said so many things that i just like want to quickly touch upon so yeah your question first i need to roast my partner really quickly i i often make a joke around the house now where i'm like i'm one of one you're two of two <laughs> <laughs> um, i'm gonna I, i'm gonna use that <laughs> yeah <laughs> you're welcome Gwen. Uh, <laughs> and um yeah i mean for me i think one of the reasons why that poem in particular is so important is that so often we don't think of black female musicians as poets or artists in that way as people who have shifted culture right like just to use beyonce as just an example like the lines that she has given us in her entire career have become part of our fabric there there are ways that we communicate with each other you know flawless i woke up like let's like you know even all the way back to like bugaboo right like all these things were things that she has given us and i to me it feels so like important especially for me as a non-black person to like acknowledge that in some way especially mm -hmm. in poetry like even as a teacher one of the, the most exciting things for me when i teach a poetry class um is i don't teach any white <laughs> poets first of all a b we study lemonade, you know, like it's such a wonderful thing to get to study lemonade and to have, you know, to be able to do something like that. So anyways, I, I feel like I'm in so much debt to so many of the women that have been, you know, summoned today that we've spoken about um, in terms of anxiety. Like, I mean, I think that was a big part of it, to be honest. Like, I think looking at other poets of color and, and BIPOC poets, Black poets, Indigenous poets, and seeing that there is a there is a path, even if they're not always the people who we give the spotlight to or that I was seeing in university and stuff like that, it was um, 
coming to their books and their writings that I was like, oh, there is room for what I want to talk about here. Part of it too is that like, and again, there's nothing wrong with metaphors, but I find white poetry so often it's like, I don't know what you're saying. Like there are just, it's so, and so there's this idea, like I think one of the reasons why people criticize Rupi's work so much, Rupi Carr, yeah. is that it's, it's like basic, it's too simple. And yeah. I'm like, it's speaking to masses of young women <laughs> Yeah. There's really something about it that resonates. And so I think that there's this idea, especially with writers of color, with BIPOC writers, that if it's if it makes sense, if it's accessible, that it doesn't have value. And that the only way for work to have value is for it to be cryptic, is for it to be unknowable. And again, it was by reading works by other BIPOC artists that I was like, no, that's that's crap. This is like, <laughs> this is white supremacy, essentially. So yeah. um, I think because that's not what appealed to me, right? Whereas look, you read books, you know, even reading like, um, I'm thinking of um, Citizen by Claudia Rankin, right? Like, it's like a very hybrid text with photos and poetry and prose. And like, for me, as a, like a multidisciplinary artist, that, like that kind of thing really appeals to me. But it's not the kind of thing that historically, when I was growing up, was given a lot of space to. So again, yeah. to answer your question in short, I, I feel like I owe a lot um, to other BIPOC writers who came before me. Yeah, thank you for that. I really appreciate that. It's um, it's a thing that I talk to students about. It's the thing that I talk to my own nephew about. Um, you know, he when he was younger, he would we gave him a little journal and we were like, "Tell us your stories," and he would do these. He always had stories, right? Uh, so he would do these things. Um, but even in writing, uh, you know, I often give direction that I find it difficult to take myself, which is, um, you know, you may not know what you're writing about, but once you start writing, it'll come to you. Like yes. writing brings us to clarity. Mm -hmm. But I feel that way about any, you know, and I want to, whether it's, you know, academic writing, other forms of writing, um, if we think of it as a art, an art practice, um, we need to begin in order to figure out what it is we're doing or order totally. for, you know, for it to kind of speak back to us. Um, and I also really like this, what you were saying around our voice, because we can think our voice um, through the written word doesn't hold anything because it doesn't sound like, you know, my voice doesn't sound like Foucault. My voice doesn't sound like Derrida. My voice doesn't sound like, oh gosh, you know. And what a good thing. <laughs> right? <laughs> Truly. <laughs> but then it can feel like, oh, how do you have that, you know, my voice doesn't sound like Fanon or others. Um, and I, I, you know, I love this conversation about how, you know, coming into your own voice through writing, but sometimes you just need to start, you know, totally. and, you know, I often remember my first kind of education oh. around poetry where, you know, it was like, what does this poem say? What does this poem mean? You know, mm -hmm. and so I would write what I thought the poem meant. And then I was wrong. And, you know, that's not what it means. And I was like, well, OK. <laughs> yeah. All right. Thanks. <laughs> this is all those words together. This is kind of how it translated for me. And so uh, something is when you're talking about how we even come to understanding through poetry, you're right. I think there are a lot of different styles of poetry that we should be reading. We should be engaging with. Um, and some of that poetry can be music. Right. Like this is the thing you just did um, to, you know, those lyrics that you're singing are also poetry. This is exactly. why others have um, there are lots of artists who write the poem and then get the music. Right. Exactly. Um, but we are engaged in some poetic work. Um, and I'm not sure if we um, I'm not sure how much we engage in that. I kind of miss some of it now because of um, where I'm teaching now, but I also try to bring it, in, bring it into my teaching as ways of, um, as other ways of knowledge, right? There's other forms of knowledge. Yeah, I mean, I'm often, I find myself like very interested when I notice hierarchies of um, consumption in um, art practice, right? And I think poetry is one of those things, especially when you place it next to pop songs, we mm -hmm. think that poetry is superior, right? In the way that like people think like certain kinds of music is a guilty pleasure. Like I don't believe in the language of guilty pleasure. It's like, if you enjoy it, if it brings you joy, if it means something to you, then it, it why shouldn't it have just as much merit? And I think the same kinds of 
the same kinds of hierarchies also exist in pop music, right? Again, to, to you know, mention Beyonce once again, like, you know, you see these memes that were like, Beck plays every instrument on his album. Beyonce needs like 50 people to write a song. And it's like, well, actually the history of, I mean, I don't need to person explain this to you, but like, anyways, like I, I, you know, I'm, I'm always, I find myself very suspicious when we start drawing these hierarchies. And so for me, yeah. it's really important to think about like pop music as a form of poetry, that there's not really a hierarchy, that poetry doesn't somehow have a higher standing just because, you know, there's a history of a certain kind of white person who has traveled in this particular mm -hmm. genre. Like there are so many beautiful songs that I think the lyrics on paper to have just as much resonance if resonance if not more resonance than um poetry i i agree i agree uh, we have this question uh in your book people change you discuss how identities are for ourselves but labels are largely for others how do you feel of um how do you feel that the functionality of labels has changed as gender fluidity has become better understood by the masses and do you find it easier to write your novel or your nonfiction books? So those two different topics, but I put them together. Yeah, thanks for that question. And thanks for that sort of like deep reading of People Change. I mean, it's so hard because one of the things I talk about just for context in People Change, I talk about how I think labels are, are extremely powerful, identity markers, you know, whether that's queer or BIPOC or trans. Um, they're especially, uh, whenever I meet someone who's like, why can't we do away with labels? Why can't we just all be human? I'm like, <laughs> we can't talk about inequality if we don't use labels, yeah. right? Um, but at the same time, the flip side is I've often felt like my labels were always me responding to oppression. I didn't come into queerness until I experienced homophobia. I didn't come mm -hmm. into a, an identity or a label of brown or or, or even South Asian until I experienced racism. And so mm -hmm. there's something about that relation, that tension that to me makes me uncomfortable. The other thing mm -hmm. that makes me uncomfortable about the labels are the ways in which I start to feel very boxed in. So, mm -hmm. you know, once you say you're trans, for me, like transness suggests transgressing gender, right? It, it, it suggests an openness, same with queer. It suggests mm -hmm. queering, you know, beyond, vast. But the moment you choose a label, suddenly you're in a new box and it's like, well, if you're trans, you mm -hmm. must do this. You must dress like this. You must, you know, be on this kind of, uh, you must change your physicality in this way. If you're queer, you cannot have relationships with this person or this person. It, it's very bizarre to me the ways in which even the most open labels wide labels end up being traps and so I, I don't have an answer to be honest like i think culturally we are very attached even within marginalized communities a lot of this policing's happened to me within marginalized communities and so i think part of it is like are there moments in which we can uh, i don't again it's such a difficult thing because i don't want to say let's get rid of labels because i think as long as there's inequality we need to be able to use these terms but I think, I think for me, one of the things that I'm doing is I'm just, I'm complicating the narrative by using all kinds of labels all the time. I'm not one thing, I'm many things. And, and in the, the book that's, you know, I talk about how in some situations I'll refer to myself as gay, and in some situations I'll refer, refer to myself as queer, other situations I'll refer to myself as bi. And, you know, in the book I say, which one is it? Which one is it? And it's like, well, it depends on the circumstance and the situation. There's some situations where, I'm acknowledging my bisexuality as a way to promote bi visibility feels really important. So I'll do that. There are some situations where I know if I use the word queer, it's going to make a lot of people maybe uncomfortable or unreceptive. So I'll use the word gay. So I think the only way I know how to complicate this, this sort of like tension around labels is to not limit myself to just one and to, mm -hmm. to, and again, use them in, 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 in earnest. I'm not wearing hats or using labels that I don't subscribe to, but to not commit myself to them, and therefore it makes other people unable to commit me to them, if that makes sense. But I, I don't see a way around it, to be honest. Um, to answer your second question really quickly, I I really write like I really like writing fiction more than nonfiction, and I think a big part of that is kind of going back to the conversation we were having earlier, where I think when you're BIPOC and if you're writing anything that's seemingly about yourself immediately there's this idea that it doesn't have value you're writing from your diary it's not it's not real art 
I, I wrote a novel two years ago called The Subtweet, and it was, I think, maybe the one of the first times in my literary career in like 10 years where people asked me questions about craft. How did you think of those characters how did you develop the plot like it felt really nice to be treated like an artist so i don't know there's something really nice to make fictional work and be seen in a particular way and i think the hard thing is uh, often what i feel pressure from in terms of industry and publishing is they want a memoir for yeah. me that's that's how they ha understand diverse voices is tell us your story of trauma or tell us your story of you know identity or whatever and so you know again i'm really trying to push against this like i just published a children's book about raccoons and <laughs> it was one of the hardest things to get made but again it, it feels important to be like look you can be trans and yeah. you can write books that are not about being trans yeah, yeah. you can have other interests like raccoons <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i love that oh my gosh um you know i do think there's a way that pushing back against identities or pushing back against um, maybe perhaps identity politics or respectability politics, um, which is really normative, right? Kind of totally. wanting to uphold the status quo, right? So you can be gay, but you have to be gay. So we understand that you're gay. Um, and so we know where you kind of fit in, you know, the straight, not straight, white, not white, right? These very kind of, uh, mm. um, heavy silos, columns, pillars, right? Um, and so using these words, queering them, right, to make odd, right? Queering them to make odd exactly, exactly. Um, is, is so productive, right? Because it disrupts the tendency to want to settle, settle uh, into something, you know, comforting. Totally. Uh, but change only happens in the discomfort, <laughs> right? Totally, totally. Right? It's it's like, oh, my God, it's too hot. I have to get up and turn the AC on. I have to get up and open a window. It's that thing. It was uncomfortable that motivated you to move to go and do a thing, right? So it's it's it provides um, an opportunity to try something different or to do something different. Um, and so I, I'm very deliberate when I say, you know, I'm a black queer femme. I've had people try and take that out of my bio. And people have asked, never Teresa, but people have asked, <laughs> people have asked do you want me to say that out loud? And I was like, yes, right? Um, it, really, because it, it it's productive. It provides a disruption in the space in terms of the um, the need for others to decide who you are. Mm -hmm. Totally. Right. Totally. To be defined by others for their use to your detriment. Uh, so I really appreciate your your response around um, labels or uneasy relationship with them, um, how we use them, how we don't use them, when we use them, when we don't use them, or how we shift them. And uh, I wonder how we can expand that more. Uh, into other areas so we could be fully seen, for example, healthcare, medicine, <laughs> and other other places where it doesn't return to or resort to the unmovable binary. Um, because as we know, that unmovable binary has caused our communities harm, caused Black people harm, queer people harm, women harm, right? It has caused men harm, it has totally. gender non-conforming folks harm. It just caused us totally. harm. So how do we disentangle that? Um, I have a question. Uh, uh, this is the, these are two people from the from the participants. They say thank you so much for this amazing session. Uh, they're wondering if you could share a bit about your journey starting your own publishing company. And also, my son really enjoyed that last poem. Oh, that's nice. <laughs> um, hello to your son. Um, yeah, I thank you. Um, again, I'm a little bit long winded because I, I like a lot. I like to say a lot of things, but I try to get to the answer. So please bear with me. So in 2016, um, I found myself very um, frustrated with um, call out culture. And again, when people criticize call out culture, um, uh, you know, again, I, I, I think that call out can be very effective when we are calling truth to power. So, you know, all, all Twitter right now is a really fun place because everyone is just dragging Elon Musk every day. It's really enjoyable. That is the kind of like call out that I find very effective. You know, Me Too is a really great example of if we want to put it under the banner of call out. I think for me, what I struggle with is 
often what I see is marginalized communities resorting to call out instead of conversation with each other. And so, you know, and I'm not trying to negate my own position of privilege within brown, queer, trans communities, but within brown, queer, trans communities, I have been called out a lot. I've also seen young people get called out a lot from older, um, you know, people within their communities, vice versa. And I would see this happen in, in Toronto a lot where it would happen at events. So like somebody would get up, do a like, you know, a presentation and then someone would stand up at someone's like art presentation and then call them out for not acknowledging this, 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 and the other thing. And again, I think part of why that's happening, and this is just my outsider take, is part of what's happening is that there's a lack of archive in our communities. <laughs> so like history is constantly being erased. So you have every generation comes up and they think they're the first. They think that they're the ones that invented poetry. And so then you have a lot of people who feel invisibilized. Um, and you have a lot, a lack of intergenerational conversation as well that's causing the sort of like invisible history. And so I, I left a lot of these events saying, I can't get rid of call out culture in our communities, in marginalized communities, but how do I model something different? And so my idea was to model a kind of intergenerational conversation. So I created a mentorship program independently through my website. Um, I had no idea what I was doing. Again, I know I have a bit of a platform, but I like sharing this story because I, I think all of us actually can can do things like this, but we we maybe choose not to or, or are afraid not to because we don't think that people will be interested. Um, but I had no idea what I was doing. I basically put it on the internet. I said, you know, I have this many years of being an artist. I'm happy to spend a year working with one BIPOC artist of, um, that's emerging. Um, on to support them on their creative practice. I got about nine submissions and I wanted to work with all of them. So I changed it instead of working with one for a year. I decided to work with one per month. I got all of their consent to do this. They were all very excited. It was a really great experience. And at the end of the year, I found myself evaluating whether or not the mentorship program was successful. And one of the things I'm conscious of I feel like I was ushered into this is a weird queer thing where you get ushered into elderdom as soon as you're like 32 or something. It's very weird. Um, <laughs> but I found myself doing that thing where I was like, do do the youth actually or do emerging people want mentorship or is this something that like older people project on to younger people or emerging people? And so I, I found myself reflecting a lot about what was it that was a common theme working with a lot of these artists and a lot of them, they they liked the mentorship. But they, what they really wanted to find out is how to get published. And it found me, I found myself thinking a lot about when I published my first book, God Loves Hair, I self-published it. And, you know, I found that that book really gave me a step into the publishing world. I suddenly got invites to do open mics and presentations and, you know, uh, readings and, and that sort of thing. And uh, people reviewed the book. People just took me seriously in a particular way. And so... I had this idea of like marrying a mentorship with leaving, so working with a, an emerging BIPOC writer for a year on, let's say, their book. And at the year, at the end of the year, in my mind, I liked the idea of them leaving with something tangible, a physical sort of like book that then they could build the next steps of their liter literary career and aspirations upon. Um, as someone who has self-published before multiple times, um, it, it, at the time, I don't know how much it's changed now, but at the time it was very expensive and um, I still self-fund a lot of my work. And so I was like, I, how, do I, how do I do this? How do I create this? And so I ended up pitching the idea to Arsenal Pulp Press, who's this amazing publisher in Vancouver, who are known kind of for being like a foremost let's just say the foremost queer publisher in, in Canada. So they've published Joshua Whitehead, uh, Amber Dawn, um, Kai Chang Tom, um, uh, Larissa Lai, like, you know, the range of BIPOC authors that they've published is pretty substantial. Uh, and so I, I reached out to Brian Lamb, who's a publisher over there, and I said, listen, I have this idea where I'd love to offer a mentorship to an emerging BIPOC writer, and at the end of working with them, I'd love to be able to publish their book. Um, will you give me an imprint? And I didn't hear back from six months. And then six months later, I heard back and Brian said, uh, yes, let's do it. And so I ended up creating um, BS Books. And just to quickly toot our horn, because it allows me to talk about the, the writers we published, I was so lucky to publish Taya Matanji's first book of short stories called Shut Up, You're Pretty. Um, she's a Black Scarborough-based writer. 
Um, she actually won the Trillium Prize in Ontario, which is basically their big book prize of the year, which was incredible. And then I also had the privilege of, in 2020, publishing Cicely Bell Blaine's a debut book of poetry, Burning Sugar. Cicely Bell is one of the founders of Black Lives Matter in Vancouver, and um, their book is excellent as well. So you should check out those books. Um, but yeah, that was sort of how I got, it's very, like I said, very long story, but that's how I got to to starting an imprint was I, I wanted to, to, to see more conversations within our communities instead of um, call out. I love that. Of course, I was muted for half a second. Anyway, all <laughs> um, oh, that is so cool. And I think sometimes it feels bigger, too big for us, right? It feels too big for us. Totally. And then also we think if we can't get somebody else to publish it, then maybe it's not worth going exactly. out into the world. Exactly. Um, and this comes back to what you were saying um, earlier about, you know, really just needing to be, you know, in yourself, knowing yourself to be like, I'm going to give this a try. Exactly. Honestly, the best advice I've ever gotten is from my mom, who has literally just always said, it never hurts to ask. And I think that's been such a motivating uh, factor in my life, like even like mm -hmm. emailing Brian. I, I'm not one of Arsenal's bestsellers. Like, I, you know, they've done very weird, you know, indie projects with me. Like, there's there was no reason for Brian to say yes to me. And I asked, and he said yes, right? Like, that's the thing. Yeah. Like, just, you, I think a lot of us have more power and privilege than we think. We just don't know it. And so sometimes it's just we have to ask, and then we can use that in a way that we didn't expect. If I didn't ask to have an imprint, I wouldn't have been able to have the privilege of, of working with these amazing mm -hmm. emerging authors, right? So, oh, yeah. yeah. And also, you know, you know, not asking is a, is a no, but it's a no to yourself. Exactly. Right? exactly. Um, you can ask them, they'll say no, but just because they said no doesn't mean it's not good or doesn't mean, right? And that's one of the hardest things I know I've experienced in, pub, you know, publishing, you know, the peer two reviewer. <laughs> and, <laughs> you know, say, no, we can't publish this. Curses. And you're like, it's trash. Only to read it later and be like, that was really good, right? I wrote that. Those That came from my from my mind, my mouth, my hands. So again, on this theme, um, uh, you gave you gave a little, but I was wondering if there's more you would offer um, advice or suggestions or guidance to students or anyone who's starting their journey, their writing journey. Yeah, so I mean, actually quickly to circle back to what you were just saying, like I think one of the hardest things about being an artist is rejection. There is just a nonstop. It just never, and it never gets easier. Like I'm, uh -huh. you know, 20 years in and it still bothers me. <laughs> it's, yeah. It still hurts my feelings. Yeah. But what has been interesting having my own publishing imprint, for, for instance, is now I'm in the unfortunate position of turning other people's work down. And what I realize on this end is that actually so often it never has anything to do with the quality of work. Mm -hmm. um, it seldom has, I should say, sometimes it does, but seldom it has to do with the quality of the work and more yeah. about what I ultimately feel a connection to and what I think I can serve and help. You know, when mm -hmm. I read his manuscript or Cicely Bell's manuscript for the first time, I felt immediate connection, but also I, I knew how I could serve the work. I knew how I could um, assist it in a particular way if they were interested. And it's it, I think that has opened my eyes a little bit because I think I go to this very sensitive place where I'm like, they hate it. They hate me. They hate everything. You know, <laughs> <laughs> follow me on social media. So they really hate it. You know, like I, it just like, it all feels terrible. And I think I, one of the things that I remind myself is that rejection for the most part, I don't think is actually personal. There's just often so many factors that contribute. And so one of the best things yeah. you can do to arm yourself is apply for a lot of things. Yeah. Like I put myself out there a lot, which increases the chance of rejection, but also awesome. increases the chance of um, approval or success or whatever word you yeah. want to use. Um, the other piece of it, so just before I, you, know, you do for, that, just before you go there, though, I wanted to follow up on this piece. We will come back, so my apologies. Sure. No, no, but I, I was thinking about it's one of the about feminist practices, um, about feminists of color practices with writers, which what which is very encouraging, right? which seems to be anti kind of what's happening currently in the scholarship world or whatever, where these editors or folks who are doing special issues will come back with really, you know, this is a really great idea. Can you expand this idea? 
you know, put this over here, disconnects, right? This kind of, so it feels like a mentorship, but maybe that's not the word we want to use. It feels like that big sister or that big sibling or mm -hmm. that someone who's just like, there's who doesn't know you, so it's not doing you a favor, right? Who doesn't know you, but is being generous, who's operating yes. in grace. Yes. To be able to say, here's this thing. And then even throughout all of that, it's like, this is great, but not for this place. Not exactly. For this. Right. Exactly. So there's another way, I think, that you were just talking about and other experiences that I've had where people have done that for me um, and where I've attempted to do that for others, right? Exactly. So instead of just saying no, can we say no and suggest where they may want to go? Like exactly. maybe, it, as you said, maybe it's not a good fit here. Maybe this is not the part of the larger larger conversation that we're having, but maybe that they're having that conversation at this journal, this magazine, this online, whatever. Can we suggest that they go there exactly. instead of pretending like, oh no, if it's you know, if it's not here, it's nowhere. As a way to try and combat that idea that, oh, I'm stupid. I'm not smart enough. I didn't yes. get it. Did it yes. Right? Don't you think? Well, that? yeah, a hundred percent. Thanks for flagging that. I mean, and that is something I do with my imprint. So like, for instance, this round, there were two books that I didn't personally connect to, but I, I was like, these aren't for me, but I think Arsenal Pulp Press might actually want to publish them as part of their publishing company. So I actually introduced them to the publisher, submitted their manuscript to the publisher and was like, I think that this would be a really good connection. Again, there's no guarantee there, but it's like, it doesn't have to be no thank you, goodbye, good luck to you. It's like, there are other ways to still find ways to support. You know, there was one year where we extended the mentorship a year, like the open call for a year. And I felt so bad because some people, I know what it's like to wait for a response. <laughs> and after mm -hmm. a year, um, because of COVID, we just had so many people being like, can we have more time? And so the original people who applied, what I did was I, because I felt bad to keep them waiting for another six months, I offered to just like have a half an hour call with them to offer any kinds of advice, guidance about like the industry or art or anything, just to be able to offer them something. So I think that's the thing. And I think this is what you're speaking to, like that there's like, there are ways to say no that aren't no. You know, there are ways to, to show support and, and similarly, there are ways to show support that aren't maybe the yes that people are after, but that are still very supportive and nurturing. The other thing I will say that I think is really important that I, it sounds so redundant to tell emerging writers, but you'd be surprised how many people I meet who are like, I want to get published. I want to do this. I, you know, <laughs> I've even met someone who was like, I want to be the next trans South Asian like icon, blah, blah, blah. And they were asking me for like writing books or whatever at like advice. And I was like, okay, well, how's your manuscript going? And they're like, I haven't written it. <laughs> so, you know, I think when I was younger, I used to think like, I will write when I have time or I will write when there's inspiration. I will make art when it hits me on the head. And that is a very, uh, uh, um, starting, that, that's a very young, I will just say it, it's very young and not young by age, but young in practice mentality. Um, the truth is creativity, whatever your medium is, is a muscle and it does require being engaged with over and over again. Uh, you know, we are a culture that for whatever reason have really subscribed into like things like fitness and or whatever, but like creativity is the same sort of thing where you have to engage in it. So if you are starting and if you are interested in building a practice, it means engaging your muscle on a regular basis, even the days you don't want to do it, even the days um, where you are tired. You know, I worked uh, a nine to five for, you know, 15 years of my career. I'm still juggling like multiple, like, you know, another job to subst like substantiate my art career. There's never the right time. There's never the right moment to be an artist. You kind of have to make time for it. So that would be my second piece of advice to you is like, my first advice is like apply for everything. Um, but my second piece of advice is, is really treat, you, treat your practice like a muscle that you have to engage with on a regular basis. Yeah, that's, when I tell you, I remind myself of that. I mean, I have to well, tell myself that too. Like this, is, when I'm giving you that advice, I'm giving it to myself. <laughs> right? Because there's sometimes you're just like, oh, I got to get up. <laughs> I, think, I, watch I have to spend <laughs> 30 minutes on this thing today. Because And then you still move it forward, right? And it's the advice I've always gotten um, when I've ever asked that question. It was like, if you want it written, if you want it written, write it. If you want it written, write it. There are no writing muses, writing fairies. <laughs> coming coming to write it while you're sleeping which sucks and it then really <laughs> sucks. <laughs> right <laughs>
and then I think of Octavia Butler. I think it was in um, her collection of essays, and or maybe she was. It was in an interview talking about Blood Child, um, where she was like, "I was working, I don't know, in a factory and whatever, and I would get up every morning and write for half an hour, and then I would go to work, and then I would come back and write at night." She was like, "I just wrote every time I had a break. I sat down and wrote, exactly. and that's why I was able exactly. to do these things." Same with Toni and, Morrison, right? Like, right? So, yeah. Yeah. Oh. Oh yeah, and Toni Morrison makes makes you read. I say makes because her books are books are still here. Makes you read every word. You cannot skip over a word in Toni Morrison's work, yeah? Because you will, and you'll be like, "I'm sorry, what's going what's on?" Because those words are exactly. Um, all right. Can you expand on the differences? Will you? Will you expand on the differences between social justice and social performance? Um, and in addition, uh, thank you. They say thank you. Yeah. Um, gosh, I keep thinking about things I want to say for the previous question. So I'm going to wrap up what I was saying in the last question, and then I'll answer this question. So the other thing I'll say is right now, we are in a very strange time, especially with social media, where mm -hmm. most of us are expected to be on it. Um, I do often tell like emerging writers and artists that, it, you know, it's free promo, blah, blah, blah. But I think especially if you were BIPOC, I think it's so important for you to create boundaries. I don't know what those boundaries are for you, but I have found for me one of the most detrimental parts of my practice has been comparing myself to white artists or white like creators or white writers. It is never the same. It will never be the same. Like we do not have the same cards. It is not the same field. Um, and it's just, I find it uh, quite uh, harmful. So, you know, I think just comparing ourselves in general, uh, which is what is encouraged through social media, is is like uh, a poison to creative practice. So for me, like for instance, my boundary with Instagram is I don't have it on my phone. If I need to use it, I like actually download it every time. I go in and I treat it like the Hunger Games. I am there for like 10 minutes. I like a whole bunch of my friends' pictures. I post my photo delete the app that is it that is my relationship to it because and i know like my partner will be like you seem like something's off and i'm like yeah i'm not having a good day and he'll be like how long were you on instagram <laughs> and he'll be like oh right like there is a direct correlation for me between my mental health and social media so i i really think again i think that there's so many wonderful things i'm not anti-social media i think there are so many wonderful things about being an artist i get to reach people i'd never be able to reach without it but i think especially if you're not white i think it's but in general i think having boundaries with is is really important especially as a creative because that stuff i think really starts to impact you you start looking at what other people are doing and thinking should i be doing that should i be doing this or how come i haven't done this or this person's doing this like this stuff is not it's not useful at all so um and then what, how am I looking at social justice um, versus social performance? So you're, you're quoting a line from my poem, Indian, that I read earlier today. Um, you know, I, I think it's hard. Like, I don't want to question. Well, I mean, there's just in that particular moment, to be very specific, this was at a time where Again, I was writing a lot of these poems in 2016, and it, it's so wonderful to see the ways in which land acknowledgements have become, you know, sort of part of the culture, um, and I and I have seen shifts in how they are done now. Like I do think that there are ways that they're done a lot more intentionally, um, and they're not just you know. But I, I remember at the time one of the most disturbing reaction like experiences of a land acknowledgement I had was like being at some event with like 200 people and a land acknowledgement was given and everyone starts clapping and. I'm just like, wait, we we stole the land and now we're clapping. I don't understand what we're clapping. Like, it just felt very weird to me. And there was just something about the ways in which land acknowledgements or the way in which I've seen land acknowledgements given that felt uh, about performing. And, you know, we see that a lot. Like, there's this phrase virtue signaling, signaling as well. Like, I think that there are, there are ways in which certain forms of um, social justice acts, which are important, which are vital, which are life changing, you know, like, again, I, I actually really believe in land acknowledgements, um, but then sometimes get wielded as a way for someone to, you know, uh, increase their social capital, uh, you know, I don't know, win favor, whatever it is, or, or just feel like they're, they're doing lip paying lip service right so i think for me in that poem i'm trying to scratch at that a little bit and to say you know why are we asking this like why like why are we doing this like if we are going to do land acknowledgements let's think about what we're doing here exactly so um 
that it's it's not super deep, unfortunately, but that's sort of what I'm I'm circling around in that poem. I think that's plenty deep. Thank you for that. <laughs> Um, and so we're we're at uh, eight twenty three Atlantic time. Um, we have another uh, uh, just under ten minutes. So if there are more questions, yeah, if there's people more questions, should to continue them. to uh, pop those in uh, into the space. Um, what are you working on? What am I working on? Um, well, if I can be annoying, I'm really excited right now because I did a play in twenty. Um, 20 right before the pandemic it feels bananas because i feel like i'm one of the only people that had the privilege of putting on a play it was in february and it's called how to fail as a pop star and it was it's it sort of like traces my like upbringing in edmonton as a queer brown person wanting to be uh basically madonna and uh <laughs> not quite succeeding and it's a story of failure which to me feels really important especially in relation to social media because i think so often we are a culture that's obsessed with success stories mm -hmm. and about thinking about meritocracy it's like if you work hard yeah. if you have talent that equals success and you know music biographies are always like i believed and i was in the right place and it all worked out and i think for every story of success we see there are you know hundreds if not thousands of people who don't quite realize whatever the dream is um and for me as trivial as it sounds um you know i think pop music as i've talked about this is a nice full circle i think as a queer kid growing up in edmonton pop music was actually my form of escape that is where i saw that is where i saw how i was going to get out that was how i was going to survive was literally through whitney houston's voice so mm -hmm. um it, it was a very important and meaningful vehicle for me and so anyways that's how it feels a pop star but what's really exciting is it, we're turning it into a digital series for cbc so mm -hmm. in january we're filming that so i i'm very very excited um about that so i'm excited about that and then i have a new album coming out next year as well so those are the like the big things that's fantastic that's fantastic Thank you for sharing that. You know, music <clears throat> music is often the thing I go to to help alleviate pain. So exactly. if I'm feeling physical pain, I will listen to music any kind. What are you listening um, to right now? Oh, I, I told you. Don't I say the new Rihanna. <laughs> <laughs> I love her, but I'm so disappointed. <laughs> oh, you are? I yes, you like it. I love it. Oh. I really do. Um, uh, oh. Oh, the, the for the soundtrack, right? Yeah, the like soundtrack. the ballad, um, lift me up or whatever. I'm like, oh, yeah, I want to jam. I don't know. <laughs> I know. I just it's the thing again. It's the thing that like works for me because I was like, I'm just going to have that in the background. Yeah. But it's been it's been so um, it's had such an impact on me that I often will hear it while sleeping. So I will dream like the melody wow. and wake up and wake myself up with the humming. Right, because I'm humming. I am not Rihanna by any means, but like <laughs> with the humming. Um, that's but I've heard that right where people are like, that's not what I. But she's coming with that. She's, she's doing the she's Super coming. Bowl. She's coming. So she's you coming. know, she's just like, I know y'all are still involved in Renaissance. Let me let let me let Bay <laughs> go ahead with that, and I'll do you know these yeah, things. That's true. That's true. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> but I also like this piece around. Um, that you've been talking about and, and using different words around respectability, this kind of expectation of how we should be in particular spaces or, um, you know, the I the word I've been grappling a lot with is professionalism. I've been teaching in medical schools and um, having more conversations in medicine around professionalism. And uh, whenever we're doing, uh, myself and my colleagues are doing something, we often start with music. So we'll start with, Ooh. you know, move, or we'll start with, you know, cafe, or we'll start with, you know, the radio play versions um, <laughs> as a way to rethink, to offer a different example of what, you know what the space could be totally. you think about professionalism um That's and so fun. i appreciate uh because we're coming to that time do i turn this over to you teresa uh for wrap up you can i i, 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 I well i'm going to take just a moment i just I, it's been a long time like i said the last time i think we saw each other was on, on university yeah. Um, Gosh. It was, I, I, I want to say the G20 or something, but it was huge. It was something, probably not that, but something bigger. Um, and you're just getting ready to head out west. Um, and so I just, you know, I feel like this is a very 
Toronto moment, you just kind of like pop up and you just start talking where you're yeah, like, seriously. You know, <laughs> this whole thing and you just have these deep, real conversations in addition to how's the weather, right? Like, yeah, exactly. this thing. Yeah. Um, but even now thinking about the weather and thinking about Christina Sharp's, you know, the weather, understanding how blackness and systemic racism kind of structure all that we are engaged in. Oh. So for me, um, and then I'll turn it to Teresa. Thank you. It was so lovely to be in this conversation so nice. with you. And I'll let you know the next time we're headed out west. Okay, please um, do. But please, you know, please continue to be one of one. Um, <laughs> you and, as well. <laughs> right? And we will we will talk again soon. So. Okay, thank you so much, much love, for today. This was course. so nice. Thank you. And I'm going to turn over to Teresa. Go ahead, Teresa. Thank you. I'm sorry. Uh, I'll be back. Thank you so, so much. You said in the beginning when you got the email, you wondered if we asked the right person. And you know what? We have an organizing committee. There was a deliberation, there were research and so on before we selected you. But I think after tonight, after this performance, we can definitely say yes, we asked the right person and that you did the Viola Desmond Legacy Lecture Series right. Thank you so, so much. So thank you, thank you, thank you so much. And of course, the the episode could not be as successful as Dr. Omosori Dryden. I kept getting texts from my crew behind the scenes. She is so wonderful doing this. So you know, Omosori, between you and Gailey, I'm out of a job. One person will do the beginning and one person will just take it over. <laughs> so I'm in good trouble. But thank you and thank you, Gaila, Kathy, Charlie, Les, and the rest of the organizing committee. The people behind the scenes, you know, they're the ones who do all the hard work and Omosori and I just come on and, you know, act like if we did all the work. But I want to thank Jolene, Karen, uh, Lida, Amina, Communications and Marketing, who did a wonderful job on the flies and so on. And of course, you, Crystal, who assisted in coordinating the entire event. So thank you and thank you, the audience. I want to end with a quote from Viola Desmond, who said that when the police grabbed her by the arms and dragged her from the theater, she said, I just sort of went limp. I wasn't going to make it easy for them. So let's be inspired by Viola and not make it easy for racism and all forms of discrimination. Good night, stay safe and be well. <laughs>